Welcome to this presentation from the Downey Seventh-day Adventist Church. We are located in the greater Los Angeles area at 9820 Lakewood Boulevard in Downey, California. We would love to have you worship with us any Saturday you are in our area. Today's message is 12 Feet of Separation. Now, here's Bill Almack. You guys know that I like old cars and trucks. My favorite, my favorite. I found a guy online that takes, he's got some old cars and trucks, and he finds places to put them in front of an old neighborhood and takes pictures of them, so we get nice modern pictures of these old trucks and cars. Let's check this out. So we got like moving day. Pretty cool. You can see he found like the old wood handle dolly that the stove is on there or something. Pretty cool. Then here he, he staged an accident. We got the tow truck and everything there. But you know, things are not always as they seem. It's forced perspective. And the trucks are just toys models. Remember moving day? Yeah. Because things are not always what they seem. We know this, right? When we look at things that maybe our teenagers are doing, they look at it really different than we do. As adults, we view their friends and how they spend their time and their money differently than they do. And sometimes we wish they could see things the way we do. You hear all the parents, amen. <laughs> sometimes we, we, we have friends that we have different opinions with on, on topics, political, religious, whatever. And, and we, we, we don't see eye to eye. Things seem different to them than they do to us. And, and things are not always what they seem. Maybe you've got a daughter who breaks up with a boyfriend. And you were not that fond of the boy. And so she's heartbroken, crying. And you are praising God. Right? My daughter who was lost is now found. Somebody killed the fatted calf. And, and she's crying because we don't always see things the same way. And I want to talk about in particular relationship today of our life and God. Because sometimes we think as our life goes, God goes. When our life is good, God is good. And when our life is bad, Maybe there is no God, right? And, and we tie our life to God. And disappointment with life easily becomes disappointment with God. When your dreams don't come true, when it's not working out, when everybody around you seems like it's going great for them, the job is good, the family is good, everything is good for them, but you are struggling. Then we start to think, wait a minute, where's God? Why doesn't God love me? And we begin to doubt. And if this hasn't happened to you personally, you probably know somebody this has happened to. We probably all have friends who have had this. And pretty quickly we begin to assume that there is no God, that God doesn't care. We blame God. And, and sometimes you can look at people's lives and you can understand how that happened. They go through some just amazing times. And, and, and sometimes it's, it seems like some folks never get a break. Never met somebody like that and it just seems like, man, if it weren't for bad luck, they'd have no luck at all. You know, and, and they just can't seem to get a break. And, 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 and you know, maybe they, they just say, you know what, God, I don't believe anymore. And, and we, we kind of understand that and how that happens. And actually, that's what happens to our character we're going to talk about today. 
We're finishing up our bad boys of Easter. This is number three. We're talking about 12 feet of separation. And the 12 feet is a rough estimate, okay? But, you know, you've heard of six degrees of freedom. Everybody says six degrees from somebody famous. Well, the 12 feet of separation, right? Okay, so what we're talking about today is, is the criminal on the cross, right? Now, think about his life and what he's gone through to get here. Probably been in and out of jail, went down the wrong path, got convicted for something. We don't even know what he did. But we know that it was pretty bad because they didn't just execute anybody. You really had to kind of mess up pretty royally to, to get that, okay? Because there were other options that they could use. You could be sold as a slave. You could be sold to, to row in the bottom of a Roman galley. And this guy is so bad, he can't be a slave, and he can't be chained to an oar in the bottom of a Roman galley. I mean, I, I don't even know what you do to get to that point. But that's how bad this guy is. And the only thing he is good for is to set an example of what happens when you don't obey the Roman government. And so they're going to execute him. They're going to execute him. Now, he knew about crucifixions. He had probably seen them before. He had witnessed them. He knew what happened. He knew the pain. He knew the noise. He knows what happens to indefensible human flesh when the bugs and the birds of prey come. He knows that it takes three or four days to die and that suicide is preferable. And he knows when death finally comes, his body is going to be ripped down off the cross, dragged through town to the dump and put on the dump with nobody to love, nobody to care. And his family has abandoned him. His friends have abandoned him. His government has abandoned him, and even God has abandoned him. Now, this particular criminal seems like he has taken on a stance of defiance, and he is going to stand up and let those Roman soldiers have it for crucifying him, like everybody before him hasn't had the same thought. But he's got some real humdingers saved up that he's going to whip out, some new curses that he's going to put on those Roman soldiers, and he is going to be defiant till the end. But he even gets robbed of that opportunity. Because as he's taken out and starting to lead to the place where they crucify him, you can't help but notice that who is also there but Jesus. And even if you don't recognize Jesus, you pretty quickly figure out who it is because the crowd is chanting his name. So let's turn to Luke 23 and see what happens in the story. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. Now, some of us grew up with the King James Version. It says a thief. We talk about the thief on the cross. I don't believe he was a thief. They didn't execute thieves. You had to be much worse than a thief to get execution. So some of our newer translations, I think, are a little more accurate here with, he was a criminal on the cross, okay? Verse 33, and when they came to the place called the skull, they were crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Now that word crucified has so much in it. There's so much pain. There's so much noise. There's so much agony. The crowds are screaming and yelling. The people are mocking them. Now, one thing we should be aware of, if you ever watched a TV movie about the crucifixion, they're always on a cross and they're way up. You know, the cross is tall. People are way up there. It probably didn't happen like that. Remember, wood was very scarce where they lived. 
and the cross would have been very low to the ground. They would have been just a few inches off the ground. Secondly, they would have wanted you to be there so that the crowds could mock you. It's hard to go up and mock somebody when you're talking to their kneecaps, right? So they brought them down low so that you could get up in their face and yell and scream and spit and slap them and do whatever you wanted. And so that's what's happening. And this noise and this pain and this agony and the crowds are screaming. The criminals are shouting. And all this is going on. So much packed into that word. Verse 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. There's two words there that have probably never been issued from the cross before. Father, because when people hurt, who do they call for? Mom. Right? Nobody says, Dad, I hurt my knee. Right? We call for mom. But Jesus calls for father. The second one is forgive. Can you imagine what the criminals are thinking? What do you mean they don't know what they're doing? They know good and well what they're doing. See, the Romans didn't invent crucifixion, but they perfected it. They knew how to make it go quick. They knew how to make it last a long time. And it was up to the whim of the centurion that day of how it went for you. It could be just ropes, could be ropes and nails. And they knew how to do it. They had perfected it. It was an art form for them. And so when Jesus says, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. The criminals got to be going, they know what they're doing. These guys are experts at this. What are you talking about, Jesus? Verse 35, the people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. You are nobody. Now, can you imagine the temptation that that is to Jesus? Oh, yeah? I'll show you who I am. Just a word will end all of this. I, I can't even imagine the temptation that that is for Jesus. See, because everybody comes out for the spectacle of a crucifixion. The whole town is there. The whole city is there. Because tragedy and pain is embarrassingly fascinating. And it still is. If you've ever been on the freeway and there's a car accident, what happens? What's happening over there? We have to stop and look. And at last, the rulers felt safe. There was no more humiliating answers to their gotcha questions. And the crowd begins to sneer and scoff at Jesus. And so there was probably some people in the crowd that had wondered if Jesus really was the Messiah. Finally, he has come. Glory to God. This is going to be great. And now look at you, you imposter. How dare you come and get my hopes up and now leave me more desolate than before. And all these people are yelling and screaming at Jesus. Some others probably fear Jesus like a caged animal. But all of a sudden, he's in the cage, and we don't have to be afraid anymore. And they can say things that they couldn't say before. Verse 36 tells us, and the soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him the wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now, the wine vinegar was the cheap wine that the soldiers could get. Soldiers didn't get paid a lot of money. 
One thing's been true through the history of the world. Soldiers don't make any money. So they, they had this cheap vinegar wine. It wasn't very good, but it's all they could get. So they offered Jesus some of that and said, hey, if you're the king of the Jews, come on and show us. Right? Remember, Jesus is right there. They're in his face. They're not looking up at him going, save yourself. They're yelling at him eyeball to eyeball. Verse 38, there was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. Now, um, the high priest that we talked about a couple weeks ago, Caiaphas, did not want it to say this. He wanted to say he claimed to be the king of the Jews. But he had also argued that Jesus should be put to death by an order of sedition, which means he was a king and was a threat. If you claim to be king, say, I could claim to be king. That's no threat to anybody, right? If I claim to be king of the United States, what happens? Not much. Maybe I get a white padded room, you know. It's no threat to anybody. But if I was the king, then all of a sudden you are a threat. So Pilate said, no, this is going to say he is the king of the Jews, right? And so people are arguing, say, hey, if you're the king, man, what's going on? So many people were cursing and taunting Jesus that even the criminals join in. Verse 39 says, one of the criminals who hung there with him hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself. And Oh, by the way, take us with you. Right? If you're the Messiah, man, what's the problem? What are you, what are you doing? Why do you go through this? Now remember, from their point of view, this is a perfectly logical question. They don't have um, the, the hindsight that we're fortunate to have. And they're like, if you're the Messiah, man, fix it. Take care of it. Aren't you supposed to be able to do something about this? See, because that criminal had equated his life with God. And when my life goes good, God is good. My life is going bad, God doesn't care. So his thinking goes, right? And so he says, life is bad, so you must not be God. You're nothing. You are not what you claim to be. You're a pitiful excuse for a Messiah. The thing is, God was just 12 feet over to his side. He was talking to God, and he didn't even know it. Now, the other criminal has somehow come to a different conclusion. Now, their life stories must be very similar to end up in this place. I don't know if they knew each other or not, but probably very similar life stories of in and out of trouble, in and out of jail, getting punished growing up, and finally they end up in this situation. But he comes to a really different conclusion. And you can almost see in the noise, in the screaming, in the pain, and everything that's going on, there's this thunderbolt, lightning stroke of epiphany that hits him. And his mind clears up for a second from the pain. And he comes to this realization. And he says, the other criminal rebuked him. That means, I don't know what word they use, but today we say, shut up. Right? As strong as language as he could use. Probably laced with some first century cursing. Right? Right? Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? See, he, he's starting to get it. He's starting to figure it out. And through the pain, there's this moment of clarity. And he says, wait a minute. We got it all wrong. 
See, he had not drawn conclusions about God based on the way his life went. Verse 41. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. After you're getting executed and you've earned it, it's just. That's one thing. But if you're innocent, that's really kind of horrible, right? And he figures that out. And he says, wait a minute. God is not to blame for our situation. And I think that sign that Pilate put above his head that this is the king of the Jews is probably right. Verse 42. Then he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. There's no bargaining. And we talked about bargaining last week. You can't bargain anymore. Because you can't say, Jesus, you know, hey, if you remember me, I promise I'll be good the rest of my life. You know, all like two days of it hanging here on the cross. There's, there's nothing to bargain with. All he can do is come to Jesus and ask for mercy and grace. And say, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This is a really profound thought. Because he has just figured out that his kingdom isn't here and now. His kingdom is to come. The disciples haven't figured this out yet. This guy's ahead of the game. And he's figured this out. Of course, we know Jesus' answer. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, a lot of people use this verse to say, this shows you go to heaven immediately when you die. There's some problems with that. Some of which is, as you know, when the Bible was written, it didn't have punctuation. In fact, most of the Bible was written, it didn't have vowels. Right? So we went back, we put vowels in later, we put punctuation in later. I think that comma is in the wrong spot. Truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Because Jesus doesn't go to heaven to see his Father. Because when he gets resurrected later, he says, I haven't seen my Father yet. If he went to paradise when he was dead, who would he have seen? His father. He doesn't. So you don't go to heaven right there. But anyway, Jesus says, listen, I will remember you and you will be with me. What good has this guy done? That's right, nothing. We don't know of any good this guy did in his life. In fact, he was so bad, they're killing him. It's not about what you do it's about who you know he figured it out he figured it out and he said Lord I got nothing to give you but please remember me Jesus says all right got you covered got you covered And Jesus is kind of saying to him, your life experience is not reflective of God. You could have kind of a bad life experience like this man. God is still good. They are not one and the same. What if that's true? What if life has left you broken but God didn't. What if life has left you abandoned, but God didn't? What if how the world thinks of you is not reflective of what God thinks of you? That's Jesus' last message to us. 
Verse 44 says, It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon when the sun stopped, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. If you've been around church for a while, you know about the temple and the curtain. And there was this big, heavy curtain over-engineered that hung and separated the most holy place from everything else. And the high priest would go in there like once a year and, and um, offer sacrifices for the sins of the people. And he had to go through a whole purification ceremony to do that. Because if you went into the presence of God and you weren't prepared, you died. And they used to tie a rope around their ankles so if they died, they could pull them back out. That's how serious this was. And all of a sudden, this, temp, this curtain that's many feet tall rips from the top to the bottom supernaturally because now we all have access to God verse 46 Jesus called out with a loud voice father into your hands I commit my spirit when he said this he breathed his last didn't take Jesus four days to die on the cross. Just a few hours. Because the weight of the burden that he carried was what killed him. Not being on the cross. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, surely this was a righteous man. Even the centurion, who must have been hard as steel to witness execution after execution after execution, could see what happened. Have you confused your life with God? Have you drawn conclusions about God based on what you've experienced? See, God is not your life. God sent Jesus to bring you life. That's really important. God is not your life. God sent Jesus to bring you life. You will not find in life what you find in Jesus. The mercy, the grace, the love. Jesus experienced life just like we do. And he never played the God card, right? Jesus never shows up at the restaurant. Um, Jesus, I'm at the corner table. Never does that. I always used to wonder why when Jesus is in the desert and he's being tempted by Satan, why is turning stones into bread such... Such a bad thing. It ain't hurting anybody. Does the stone care if it becomes a piece of bread? Maybe that's a step up for a stone. I don't know, you know. Why is that such a sin? Because it's Jesus playing the God card for himself. And he never did that. He never did that. He knew what it was like to be lonely. He knew what it was like to have his disciples abandon him, his best friends. He knew the pain. He knew what it was like to ask God for something and for God to say, no. He took life in the face just like we do. And Jesus, in spite of his life, had confidence in God. See, this in spite of life Faith and confidence that we have in God is a powerful, powerful thing. I don't know about you, but I've seen it. I've seen it in hospitals. I've seen it at graveside. I've seen it when children are mourning the loss of their parents. And the look in their eyes says, I still believe. I've seen it when parents are mourning the loss of their children. 
And today, you are sitting with people who are here in spite of their life experience. And they're saying, I have confidence in God. I have faith in God. That regardless of how my life goes, God is still good. See, life happens, but God can be trusted. Life happens, bad things happen. The devil is active and powerful and roaring like a lion. And life happens, but God can still be trusted. As long as you have clenched your fists and you're holding on to what you have gathered, you will not experience that. It's not until you open up and you say, God, I surrender. It's not until you recognize that me trying to do as best I can is pointless. And when I say, God, here it is. I trust you in spite of what happens, regardless of what happens. When you throw your hands up in, dis in surrender, you may discover the answers you've been looking for for years. Let's pray. Heavenly, Heavenly Father, Father, help us to surrender, Lord. Help us to have the confidence and the faith in you that in spite of life, regardless of what happens to us, regardless of how life treats us, Lord, God is good. And we can trust you. And having a relationship with God is not a get-out-of-jail-free card for life's bad events and bad happenings. It's a get-out-of-eternity card. Lord, because we want to spend eternity with you in paradise. Lord, help us be like that criminal on the cross that says, Remember me, Lord. I surrender. Please remember me. Be with us now. In Jesus' name, amen.